Okay, so a kind of lengthy section that I assume will take us both today and tomorrow to get through. We are going to start looking at the inverse trig function. And we're going to look at their derivatives. And then we're going to look at using them to take integrals. Because remember that integrals are essentially antiderivative. So every time you learn a new derivative, you also learn a new antiderivative. Knowing that the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared, that's you integrate the secant squared. And this might seem like it's coming at a slightly weird face in the sequence because we really did differentiation in calculus one, but it's because we're more interested in the integrals we're going to get than we are in the derivatives that we teach this in calculus two. Having said that, we'll of course try to do a thorough job of teaching both derivatives and integrals. So let's remind ourselves briefly um, what the inverse trig functions are, the nitty gritty details like domain restrictions aren't going to be so interesting to us, but Two functions F and G are inverses if when we compose the two functions together. They cancel each other out. So probably the simplest, or at least the quickest example of this behavior is x cubed versus the cubed root of x. These are inverses of each other because if we compose them, well, the cubed root and the cube eliminate each other. And likewise, if you compose them in the other direction, the cube root and the cube eliminate each other. And it's nice if a function has an inverse, because if a function has an inverse, we can use it to solve equations. Um, Continuing on with this cubed root, suppose you have x cubed equals seven. You could take the cubed root of both sides, and on the left, 
the Q root and the Q cancel out, and you get that X is the Q root of seven. And then you can go to your calculator or Wolfram Alpha or whatever you're using and type in the Q root of seven and get your answer. So, in terms of trigonometry, it would be really nice if the sine, for example, had an inverse. Because if the sine had an inverse, we could solve equations like this. We'd apply the inverse whatever we call it, to the sign, and we'd apply the inverse, whatever we called it, to 0 0.7. And on the left, those things would cancel and leave us with x. And on the right, we'd have the inverse applied to 0 0.7. And hopefully, just with as with the cubed root, we could go to our calculator, or we could go to Wolfram Alpha, or whatever, and get an answer. Well, it's a little more complicated than this, though, because not every function has an inverse. And in particular, none of the trig functions, properly speaking, have inverses. And that's because the trig functions are not one to one. So, Think of a function as a rule that takes numbers in one set and assigns them to numbers in another set. The inverse of f is a rule that goes the other way, that reverses all of those arrows. This can be a problem in situations where there are two numbers in the first set, that are both set to the same number in the second set. I mean, this is a thing that's allowed to happen. X squared does it. Two squared is four, negative two squared is four. So two and negative two are both set to the same number. But if you try to now define an inverse, we have a problem. Because this diagram, where one number is sent to two different numbers, is not allowed. Um, in fact, that's in, right baked into the definition of a function. A function is a rule. It can be literally any rule, except that it's not allowed to take one number and assign it to two different numbers. And the sign and all of the trig functions Let's unclutter that a little. The sign and all of the trig functions do this. I mean, zero and two pi 
both get sent to zero, for example, under the sign mapping. So the sign does not have an inverse. We can formalize that by saying that a function is one, two, one. If two inputs giving the same output, f of a equaling f of b, means that actually you don't have two inputs. A equals B, and you only have one input. And in terms of this trig function, the sine, the sine is not one, two, one, because the sine of zero equals the sine of two pi, but of course zero is not two pi. These are different numbers. And then we can have a statement or a theorem or a call it what you will. Only one to one functions have inverses. Or stands for corollary. It's a fact that follows immediately from another theorem. So this theorem immediately gives us this corollary that none of the six trig functions have inverses because none of the six trig functions are one to one. You can see that none of the six trig functions are one to one, either kind of algebraically or graphically. And I mean, the algebraic argument looks like this. We, for each of the six trig functions, we can just explicitly find two numbers that give the same output. We could also think of this in terms of the so-called horizontal line test. I don't know why I said so-called, as if I think that's a pseudonym. The horizontal line test says that if you can draw a horizontal line that hits the graph in multiple faces then the function is not one 
two one and in the last frame I said that being one to one is the same as being invertible so the function is not invertible and now if we remember or even if we don't remember, it's easy enough to go to Desmos and see what these trig functions look like. There's the sign. Here is a horizontal line that hits this graph in more than one place. It hits it at both those points, for example. Here's the cosine, and again, this horizontal line. Let me move it maybe up slightly so it's more visible. This horizontal line hits this curve in multiple places. It's not one to one. I trust that, that you remember these graphs. The other graphs are may be less memorable, but here's the tangent. You see this horizontal line is hitting the tangent in a bunch of places. The cotangent are now getting to stuff that really might be testing our memory. And then the cosecant and the secant both have very weird looking graphs. But if we drag that line up a little, here is a horizontal line that's hitting it in multiple faces. And the cosecant is gonna look very similar. And again, this horizontal line is hitting it in more than one place. And why this horizontal line test works? I mean, look at where I've put this horizontal line. I put it at 1.9. Here's a value where the cosecant equals 1.9. Here's another value where the cosecant equals 1.9. So 0.554, the input, is set to 1.9. And 2.587, the input, is also set to 1.9. And of course, 0.554 is not. 2.587, those are different numbers. So this function is not one to one. So this is a problem for us. Remember that we wanted inverses so that we could solve equations that look like this. Um, does this just mean we have to throw up our hands and never solve these equations? Well, of course, the answer is no. We, I say we as if I'm taking credit for it, this was, many centuries ago, but mathematicians came up with a solution to this problem. So here is the sine of x, and here is 0 0.7. And the sine of x equals 0 0.7 actually has a bunch of solutions. It has infinitely many solutions. Negative 5.508 and negative 3.917 and positive 0 0.775 and 2.366. 
all of these X values are solutions. So the decision that mathematicians came to to solve this issue was to say, okay, this has infinitely many solutions. We're just going to find one of them. And then if once you found one, there are ways to find others, but that's pre-calculus trigonometry. That's not stuff we need in calculus. So how can we find just one solution? Well, if this function were one to one, it would be easy. We have an inverse and we use the inverse. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a new function that is one to one. And we do that by only looking at the sign on a limited interval. We just look at the sign from negative pi over two to pi over two. Um, and now notice that even with these limitations, we do have a value where this equals 0.7. So putting this restriction on the sign didn't get rid of all of our solutions. We still have a solution. And this function satisfies the horizontal line test. So it has an inverse. And we can use the inverse of this function to find this solution. Going a little fast because, again, this is hopefully review, but for each trig function, We put a restriction on the domain so that the trig function is one, come on, this marker is on its way out, so that the trig function is one to one, which is to say invertible on that restriction. So probably at some point you were forced to memorize all of these restrictions for the side, it's negative pi over two to positive pi over two for the cosine. zero to pi for the tangent. Let's see, what would it be for the tangent? It would probably be negative pi over two less than x less than positive pi over two 
And I can't remember off the top of my head what we have for secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Um, for this class, that's a level of granularity that we're not going to need. We just need to know basically what these functions are, which is that we restrict the trig functions to an interval. And then we define the inverse of the restricted trig function. So we restrict it so that the trig function is one to one. That makes it invertible. And we take the inverses of these restricted trig functions. And these are what we call the inverse trig functions. We say that they're the inverse trig functions, even though they're really not. They're the inverses of these new functions that we created by restricting the domains of trig functions to intervals. So the terminology is a slight lie, but inverse trig function rolls off the tongue more than inverse of the function we create by uh, restricting the domain of the trig functions. So you can see why they do it. Let's use the sign as the example, as our example. The inverse sign is written like this. Or it is written like that. And I mean, I haven't done a poll or anything like that. My suspicion is that most people find this notation a little old-fashioned, but it's the notation I grew up with, so I guess an advantage of being the professor is that I can use the notation I want to use, which will be this, this arc notation. Um, I do not care in your homework on tests. You can use whatever notation you want. So we have six inverse trig functions. Only three of them matter in any real way. And the three inverse trig functions that we think matter and that we're going to talk about are maybe not the ones you expect. We're so used to thinking of the main trig functions as being the sine, the cosine, and the tangent. But we don't care about the arc cosine in a calculus context. Instead, we're going to look at the arc sine, the arc tangent, and then our dark horse competitor, the arc secant. And we'll say a few words about why that is in due course, why the arc cosine isn't interesting to us. So at this point, uh, we're going to just start putting stuff on the board. It's unfortunately more stuff to memorize, more derivatives to memorize, and hence more antiderivatives to memorize. Um, 
not much we can do about that. Does anybody have any questions before we proceed? We'll start with the arc sign. The derivative of the arc sign of x is one divided by the square root of one minus x squared. So it's unfortunately a pretty messy looking derivative. And of course, looking ahead of it, Knowing a derivative gives us an integral. And that integral probably looks like nonsense. I mean, that is to say, it's certainly the integral. But I think our tendency is to look at that and say, well, why would something that looks like that ever show up in the real world? I mean, it looks kind of fake. Integrals that look like this show up a lot when you're doing geometry and working with right triangles. Like if you have a right triangle and something like Well, we won't get this exactly. We won't get the subtraction, but when you have right triangles and you hit them with the Pythagorean theorem, you get, this isn't quite right, um, I mean, this isn't quite what we see in the integral, but we get these square roots where we have subtraction or addition, and we've got a one, or we've got a number other than one, and we've got an x squared. So these integrals do show up in real world applications, most commonly a geometric real world applications. In fact, I think I botched that a little. I think we can get this square root to show up exactly if we look at a right triangle like this. We can indeed. And once we start working with the integral, we'll see if we want to have a number other than one there, we can. And that will give us an integral that we'll be able to take, again, using this formula. So in spite of its sort of messiness, this is something that shows up in applications. In fact, repeating what I said earlier, I'd say the integral shows up in more applications than the derivative which is, again, why we're 
doing this in calc to this two instead of calc to this one with the other derivatives. Having said that, this is now a derivative we know, and we should be able to work with it, just like we can work with other derivatives. Let's take this as an excuse to brush up on some calculus one stuff that we probably haven't seen in a couple of months. Let's take the derivative of x squared times the arc sine of x. So we have multiplication there. We have a product who remembers the product rule? How do we take this derivative? You multiply one by the derivative and then you add it to the other one multiplied by the derivative of the other. That is correct. Thank you. We have these two functions. We'll leave one of the functions alone. and multiply it by the derivative of the second function. Then we'll do the same thing, except this time we'll leave the arc sign alone and multiply by the derivative of the first function. And then we add those products together. We should also be able to take derivatives where we've got compositions, something like the arc sine of x plus the sine of x. Uh, don't try to do anything clever here. Um, it's true that if you didn't have that addition, that arc sign and that sign would just totally cancel each other out and you just have X. But because you do have that addition, there's no way to simplify this. Let's go slower than we did with the product rule, because I think this is a little more complicated. What we have here is composition. We have a function outside of the parentheses, and we have a function inside of the parentheses. And we plug and play with the chain rule. The chain rule says we should take the derivative of the outside function, that's one minus x squared, But we should plug the inside function inside of it. So instead of one minus x squared, we have one minus the inside function squared. And then, the chain rule says, 
you need to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And the derivative of x plus the sine of x is the cosine of x. And there's your derivative. And it's a messy function, and there's nothing you can do to it to truly make it not messy. I mean, I guess if, if you wanted to, you could do the multiplication. And that one plus the cosine of x will go up here. It's not really obvious to me that foiling that out makes what's under the square root any simpler. That it, it always seems so arbitrary. Sometimes you foil, sometimes you factor. Like what's simple, what's not simple, what simplification mean? I'll just leave that be. So there's the derivative. And as we've said, the derivative gives us an antiderivative, an integral. So, in the homework, people seem to be pretty confident doing a u-substitution, and that's good because almost all of the examples we do with these inverse trig functions are going to involve some kind of, usually small, but some kind of u-substitution. Let's take this integral and let's complicate things. Example. One over the square root and instead of x squared, let's put a number in front of it. That is to say, we have the x squared, but we also have the four. <laughs> and at this point, sort of one of the fundamental challenges of calculus is going to start to emerge that there is no, first of all, there is no one size fits all method of taking an integral. And second, that it's not always going to be obvious what method you need to use. So look at that versus this. These integrals look simpler, look similar, but only one of these has anything to do with the arc side. The integral on the right can be dealt with entirely as a U substitution problem. So now that we're a little into this, we have to pause and think. Is this a U substitution? Is it something else? And it may sometimes happen that we go down an incorrect road and have to sort of regroup and just start again. I mean, it might happen 
that we decide to try do substitution and only after it's failed and we see, well, we don't have any X's, so we can't make du. Let's try something else. Um, historically on tests, I think the number one cause for students doing badly is starting something. That something doesn't work, but it's a test and there's a time limit and the student is under stress. So it's hard for them to just scribble that out and start over and they try to make it work even though it doesn't. Well, that was a bit of a digression. And actually, U substitution does work here. It just requires a different thought. If we have one minus x squared instead of one minus four x squared, we'd be, we have four minutes left. I think that actually, this is probably not something I want to rush through in four minutes. Picking up with this example will be an excellent starting point on Wednesday, tomorrow. I do want to get through this. Usually on Thursdays, we don't use the full 75 minutes. We might tomorrow to try to finish this section.